So this presentation is called How to Build Wealth and Keep It Like the Rothschilds. If you think about it, wealth isn't really measured by how much money you make. It's really measured by how much money you keep. And that point is well illustrated in the uh, history of, of two families, the Vanderbilts and the Rothschilds. Cornelius Vanderbilt made his money in the railroads and, and Rothschild made his money in banking. So Vanderbilt died in 1877 and he left behind a fortune of $105 million. Now that's pretty big by anybody's standard, but now that's uh, kind of uh, lottery money. But at the time that Vanderbilt died, that was the largest fortune ever accumulated accumulated by one person okay and so you know think of you know hundreds of billions of dollars rather than just uh, millions of dollars with the value of a dollar changing anyway but he left one million of it to charity uh, or to a charitable cause that was Central University uh, who immediately renamed their whole university Vanderbilt University that's probably done as much to uh, propagate the legacy of Vanderbilt as anything but he left the rest of it 104 million dollars to his heirs lucky day for them right well 95 years later three generations later there were 120 Vanderbilt descendants that gathered for a family reunion at Vanderbilt University and there wasn't a single millionaire left among them in other words, it only took three generations for the largest fortune ever accumulated to be lost, spent, or squandered. And that just seems to be the way it is with inherited fortunes, right? Well, the story of Rothschild is a lot different. Rothschild died in 1812, and so that was 60-some years before Vanderbilt died. So if it was just a matter of time passing before you were wealth is completely dissipated his fortune would have gone away longer ago than uh, Vanderbilt's but instead of just handing his money over to his heirs he left behind a three-part family wealth management system and that system went like this the number one part of it was that the family's wealth was going to be kept together in a family bank. It wasn't going to be divided up amongst his heirs. And the second part was that any member of the family could take out a loan from the family bank, but it had to be repaid. Hmm. So what did this mean? Did they really have access to the money? Yes, they did. If they wanted to start a business, they could go to the family bank and get a loan. But once that business was up and operating, they needed to pay back the family bank plus interest. If any family member wanted to go and get an education and better themselves, they could go to the family bank and get a loan for their education. But when they were done and they were earning money that was the benefit of the education, they needed to pay back the family bank plus interest. They could invest in things, right? Buy property, but when they sold it, they needed to pay back the family bank plus interest. It seemed like a pretty clever way to keep people from just wasting their money. In other words, you could have access to money, but it needed to be for something that was going to pay for itself. There was one other rule of the family bank, and that was that they had to get together once a year to share their lessons learned. If one member of the family figured out some profitable means of making money, they needed to share that with everybody else. If they figured out something that didn't turn out to do so well they also needed to share that with the rest of the family and the only consequence of not getting together once a year was that you'd be out of the family bank if you didn't so he looked forward into the future and thought about you know I don't want these guys fighting with one another I want them to be uh, together in the future and by the way that's exactly uh, the problem that the Vanderbilts had Two generations after Cornelius Vanderbilt died, the family members, what would have been his grandchildren, feuded amongst one another, trying to build, outdo one another in building the most expensive and elaborate uh, mansions on Madison Avenue in New York City. 
50 years, by the way, after they built those mansions, they were all, every one of them, torn down. Total waste of money, arguably. So Rothschilds had a different strategy. If, if you figured out how to make money, you needed to share it with other family members. If, if you did something that lost money, um, you, you needed to share that with other family members. How well did his family wealth management system work? Well, the Rothschild's fortune, it's hard to put a handle on how large it is, but it's estimated to be between $1 and $100 trillion. That's colossal. Why is it so hard to figure it out? Because it's all spread around the world quite literally. So now that story sounds great, but the average American like you and me, we don't have all kinds of millions of dollars, but do you know that the average American makes over a million dollars during their lifetime career? They just don't keep it, right? It, it, let's talk about a person that earns $50,000 a year, and that's not beyond most people. In fact, the average family income in the United States is pushing, uh, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. But what if I could make my fifty thousand dollars a year and save a hundred percent of it and have it grow at something just something modest, like five percent a year? You realize that after forty years, my working career, I'd have over six million dollars accumulated. Let's see how that works. And here I click on this go to income calculator and I bring up a um, spreadsheet that we built to illustrate this point. So if we have a, an annual income of $50,000 a year, no taxes coming out of it, and guess what? I realize that's unrealistic. But if I could save every penny that I earned and grow it at just 5% a year over my career of working, I accumulate over six million dollars. Now let's put in some numbers that make this more realistic. First of all, the average tax on income for the average American is 28 percent. Now some people might think I missed my number there because they're thinking about their federal tax rate, which isn't as high as 28 percent. But I'm really just talking about the tax on your income, and that includes your federal tax uh, income tax, your uh, state and local income tax, and your Social Security tax, which takes uh, the employee portion at least, which takes away from your uh, take-home pay. So if that, which is in, in the right number, 28%. That means for every $50,000, I really only took home $36,000. But you know what? That still would accumulate or grow to be over $4 million in 40 years. Still pretty good. Yeah, but what about the money that I spend? Because that comes out of my after-tax dollars. Most Americans spend 90% of their after-tax dollars and even if I do what I would consider to be a fairly good job, saving 10% of my after-tax income and growing that at 5%, look what it does to this graph. This green shadow here is what could have been. That's my what you might call my maximum potential. And this is down here, way down here, the reality even if I'm saving at 10% a year and growing it at 5% a year. You see, this is so much smaller that it demotivates many savers. It, it, they think, well, I'll just catch up later because I've got time to do that on my 40-year journey of working. But where does that leave most people? It leaves most people thinking that to get ahead, they've got to work harder or stop spending or take on more risks. You know, they got to earn more money in that that calculator that I just showed. That would make a difference. Or they got to spend less, not 90% of what they're making, but less than that. Yes, that would make a difference. Or they got to take on more risk. Oh, I can't I can't get to where I want to go just growing my money at a safe 5% a year. So they uh <laughs> invest in things that um create losses. Well, what if there was a way to get ahead without doing any of those three things? 
I'm going to argue that there is, and I'm going to go through it in the following way. First, let's look at the three different ways that people view money. They view money as a spender, or can they can view money as an investor, or they might, and this is the rare case, view money as a banker. That was the way Mayor Rothschild viewed money, and we know how that turned out for his family. But let's talk about viewing money as a spender for a minute. The spender views money as a way to buy stuff, every, but every purchase costs him interest. So when a spender borrows money to buy something, I've got to pay up. He has to pay up interest to the person he borrows money from. But also, if the spender uses his own cash, once that cash has been spent, he's given up the interest that he could have earned on his money. Like back when I was talking about that uh, typical American earning 5% on his after-tax dollars, once I spend any money, that money's not earning any interest, right? So the spender is always giving up interest, right? He's either paying interest or giving it up. He's never building up. Let's look at buying a car as an example of this, because I've got a calculator that shows this, I think, pretty well. So there's three ways to buy a car, right? And, and so I'm spending money on a car. And by the way, I can't get away uh, without having a car. Right, um, I needed to get to work or take my kids to school or whatever, but I can borrow cash to buy the car, I can pay cash that I've saved up to buy the car, or I can use this concept called private family banking. And let's see what difference these three options might make. I've got a calculator here. I'll click on go to buying cars graph. And the first thing we need to do is fill out, well, what's the average cost of a car? Let's put in $30,000. The average cost of a new car is a bit more than that now. Um, I pay interest on the car, all right? And uh, let's say that the interest rate's 5.5%. I looked it up uh, today. The um, interest rates are as low as 5%, uh, can go way up from there. Um, but uh, I just put in an average of 5.5%. And let's say that I buy a car every five years. Well, um, you know, I had a friend that I mentioned this to, and he said, well, my wife and I buy a new car. Uh, uh, well, we, 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 uh, we drive our cars for 10 years. That's pretty good, okay? Um, but I said, well, you know, but you both have a car, right? Yes. I said, do you buy two new cars at the same time or do you stagger that and he said oh I see what you mean yeah we are buying a new car every five years even though we drive our cars for 10 years so let's look at what that costs a person if they do that 11 times well you know, you, it's easy math, right? I can take $30,000 and multiply it by 11. That's $330,000. That's what my cars cost me throughout my lifetime, all right? And if I borrow money to buy these cars, it costs me more. But you might not have realized this, but how much more did it actually cost? Well, it only costs, but the math is accurate here, guys. It only costs forty-eight thousand dollars more over the course of a whole lifetime. Is that forty-eight thousand dollars going to sustain you in retirement? Is it going to really make a humongous difference in your lifetime? I'm going to argue it probably doesn't, and that's why many Americans are not that motivated to pay cash for their cars in every car purchase because it doesn't seem to make that big of a difference in the long run. But here's the thing that I think is amazing. And this, uh, I'm going to state it this way. How much money did the bank make off these car purchases? Now remember, the bank didn't build the car, buy the car, sell the car, or drive the car. The bank is just the place that held the money that the cash buyer 
was saving up to pay cash for his or her car. And the bank is the one that loaned money to the borrower when the borrower wanted to buy a car that he or she had not saved up for. Now, whose money did the bank loan to the borrower? Guess what? Banks do not loan their own money. Okay, they've got cash reserves, but those cash reserves have to sit in reserve. The bank loans to the borrower the money that the saver is saving. Okay, how much money did the bank make during this 11 car purchase period? The bank made $380,820. That's more money than the borrower spent or the cash buyer spent. Can you see why really, really clever financial people get into the banking business? And guess what? This is what you and I can do if we build our own banking system and function as our own bank, what we call private family banking. Let's look at a graph of how the borrower's money goes. And this is a graph over this uh, long period of time, of the borrower buying cars every five years. The first thing that happens when the borrower borrows $30,000 is he goes in debt by 30,000 and then each year he pays um, he pays six thousand dollars plus and works his way all the way up to zero and then he plunges back down thirty thousand dollars in debt when he makes the next car purchase okay trying to get ahead this way is sort of like bobbing for apples off the bottom of a swimming pool it doesn't work but what about the guy who thinks he's smarter and he pays cash for his cars? Well, the first thing he has to do is start saving $6,000 a year for five years until he's got $30,000. And then he takes that $30,000 and goes and buys a car. And his savings account plunges down to zero. Well, of course. Now, I've had people tell me before that they like to pay cash for a car so they don't have a car payment. To which I've said, well, well, wait a second, are you going to drive that car for the rest of your life? Well, unless you're 90 years old, the answer is probably not. Um, so you're going to buy another car sometime, yeah. Well, are you saving for that next car? Well, if you are, like this cash buyer has to do, then really you're kind of making a car payment back to your savings account, right? And once you get all the way back up to $30,000, you go spend it on another car. And then you save until you're back up to $30,000 and spend it on another car. And if you look at this graph really carefully, what you realize is both the borrower and the cash buyer are both on a race to zero throughout their whole life. None of this money here ever goes into what you could call something that's uh, a wealth accumulation. But let's look at one more graph. And this is the graph that I call building cash. This is playing the game of being your own banker or private family banking. And here's how it works. You save up money in an account in your own bank, if you will, and if you invest one more year of patiently waiting to accumulate the money to make your next car purchase, you can be on the wealth curve for the rest of your life. Because you can play the bank in your own financing and earn that money that I said the bank makes off of the, the person that saves up cash, loaning their money to the person who borrows cash. If you play the middleman on that, even for your own car purchases, this is what you could eventually accumulate. And that number turns out to be that number that I shared before, $380,000 plus over the lifetime of buying cars. And these blue lines and red lines here are the same ones that I showed back here. They're just dwarfed 
by the size of the accumulated cash for somebody that functions in being their own banker. Well, let's find out how to do that. Before we do, I want to talk about the other way that people might view money. We all view money as a spender. I mean, we've got stuff we've got to spend money on, right? Food and clothing and shelter and cars. But the investor looks at money a very different way. The investor not only pays for you know his uh, lifestyle expenses, but he, he or she has got extra money or money that they want to see grow. Well, why not? But this is the way the, the, the investor thinks. He views money as a way to buy investments, not just buy stuff that goes down in value, but he's trading his money for something that he goes, hopes will go up in value, right? Now, that makes perfect sense, and there are things that we all, in retrospect, have seen go up in value. I was talking to my friend the other day, and we were talking about cars. My brother had a unique car that he got back in 1969, I think, and that car, uh, you know, was a I think a three thousand dollar car. He ended up when it was used selling it for fourteen hundred dollars. If he'd hung on to it, it'd probably be worth over a hundred thousand dollars. You wouldn't know, right? The thing about investments is I'm trying to project into the future what the thing that I'm trading my dollars for today will be worth. But it brings with it risk. See, if I need my money out or I decide, let's just say I decide, you know, I've held this stock, for instance, for just long enough, I don't think it's going to go up anymore. So I want to sell it. Well, who am I going to sell it to? Am I going to sell it to somebody that thinks it will go up from here? Because <laughs> if I think it's not going to go up, why would somebody else think it is going to go up? That makes a, a problem, doesn't it? Maybe I sell when uh, I need the money, okay? Uh, maybe I retired and I want to start pulling money out of my investments. Well, I'm doing it when I need the money, not when it might be the best time to sell. So every investment exposes me to risk. And when I do get it right, when I get a gain, that costs me taxes. We'll look at that. So let's play a little investment game here for a second. And let me show you one of the problems. Imagine that you've got $100,000 to invest. And your investment goes up by 10% in the first year. Well, 10% of 100000 is 10000 So now I've got an account value of $110,000. But what if in that second year, the um, investment goes down by 10%? Am I back to even? Well, if it goes down by 10% and the value of my account was $110,000, 10% of $110,000 is $11,000. So if I subtract $11,000 from $110,000, I've got $99,000, not $100,000. Now let me tell you, in the case of ups and downs of risky investments, if I only lose $1,000 over two years, I'm calling it pretty much okay, right? It ain't great. It's not great at all, but it could be worse, right? Well, here's how it could be worse. Um, you know, if your stock market portfolio goes down or any investment that you have goes down by 10%, it has to go back up by 11% for you to be back to even. If it goes down 20%, it's got to go up 25% to be back to even. And you can see this graph goes on and on and on. Now, is this unrealistic? Let me just give you some numbers that I looked up just today. Apple stock is down year to date by 25%. Okay? Um, Google stock is down year to date by 38, uh, rounded 39%. Well, that means that it's going to have to go up. So, so let's just say it's, it's gone down already 40% year to date. It's going to have to go up 67% to be back to even. 
for the year. Um, Amazon stock has gone down 49%. Let's round that to 50%. It's got to go up 100% to be back to even just for the year. Okay. Same with Tesla stock. Tesla stock is down uh, 54%. Okay. And let's just go to the extreme here. Is anybody stupid enough to invest in a stock that's gone down 70% just in since the beginning of the year? Well, anybody invested in Facebook, that's what happened. Facebook is down 69% plus just since the beginning of the year. It would have to go up 233% to be back to even just for what somebody had at the beginning of this year. All right? That's the way to not get ahead. <laughs> All right? Um, so, recommendation, if you do get a, um, a growth in your investment, look out for the tax man, all right? If you could avoid this, that would be great, because there's really three great ways to um, see your savings go away. One of them is um, with market losses. Another one is with taxes, and a third one is the interest that you might pay by not using your own money. Okay, here's an interesting um, calculator that I want to show you, and it, it's it's showing the the power of um, multiplication here or growth. Let's say I started a little business and I started with one dollar. Okay, and I could earn a hundred percent rate of return on my dollar every year. If I didn't have any taxes taken out of that growth, it would only take twenty years for my dollar to turn into one million forty eight thousand five hundred and seventy six bucks. Okay, you might think, well, what kind of business could uh, do that? Well, you know, uh, twenty years ago. I thought it was dumb for people to spend money on bottled water, okay? Well, I still kind of think it's dumb, but I see people doing it all the time. You know, you could go buy two bottles of bottled water right now for 50 cents if you shop at uh, Sam's Club, <clears throat> and you could go out and sell them for a dollar, and that would be a deal at certain locations. So you could take your one dollar, buy two bottles of, of bottled water, and sell it for uh, two dollars and you're a dollar ahead you keep doing that you build a little business out of that and in 20 years you'd have a million bucks that's awesome uh, but there's something missing in this graph here and that's how much money you got to pay in taxes so let's go from zero taxes to something reasonable. What's a reasonable tax rate? Let's say you're a politician and you're looking at this person that's going to get a million dollars. They're part of the dirty, rotten 1% that's got all the money in the world, and they need to be paying their fair share. So let's say we're going to tax them at 30%, and that's very little right, compared to how rich they are. Well, what, what's my number going to be at the end there? Uh, Kent, it's not going to be $1 million anymore if I have to pay taxes. Well, what would it be? I always stop and ask everybody to tell me what they think if I'm sharing this with a group. And somebody will say, uh, it'll be $700,000. And although that doesn't sound way off, somebody is going to go, no, nah, it's got to be less than that, or he wouldn't ask the question. And so they'll say, I think it's going to be 600. And somebody will pipe up and say, no, it's going to be more like 250,000. So whatever they say, I always say, well, you guys are close. And then I hit enter, and it recalculates the spreadsheet. And what was a million dollar business turned into $40,000. And someone asks, oh, wait a second, where did the million dollars go? 
what went to the government, right? No. The government only made cumulative $17,000 off this business enterprise. Where did the million dollars go? It, it never got made. It, <laughs> it, it was like the, the goose that laid the golden egg. You know, the family that had the goose that laid the golden egg got very greedy, and that, so they cut the goose open to get more eggs out all at once, and they killed the golden goose. That's what happens with higher taxes. That's what happens with taxes, period. Uh, they stifle wealth accumulation. But <clears throat> watch this. This will surprise you. So at 30%, the government makes over the period of 20 years off this business $17,000. And if that's not enough, then the government would raise the tax rate to 40%. And watch what happens. The guy that ended up with $40,000, well, his goes down, but down by a lot from $40,000 to 12000 But the government's accumulate, accumulated uh, tax revenue went from $17,000 to 8000 Isn't that backwards? Yeah. It's a backwards way to increase your tax revenue, to keep taxing the entities that earn money. <laughs> but that's what politicians often do. And somebody comes along and says, well, the tax rate ought to be, you know, a flat 10%. And everybody... Uh, you know, uh, or people on one side of the aisle accuse them of, oh, you're just trying to give a tax break to the rich. Well, let's let's do that just just for ha ha's. Let's pretend like the ideal tax rate was ten uh, percent. Let's put in ten percent there, and we know that that's going to help the businessman, right? Instead of making you know twelve thousand or forty thousand, now he's got three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, but the government collected. $41,000. Watch this. If the tax rate is higher, the business owner makes a lot less money, but the government collects less money as well. Now, in case anyone ever asks you, what's the ideal tax rate? Let me tell you what the answer is. It's zero. Well, why do I say that? Because that gives the guy that actually earned the money the maximum return. <laughs> See that? But if the person asking the question is asking it from the perspective of the government who wants to get as much as the government can, then the answer is 10%. Okay? 10% will give to the establishment, <clears throat> the government entities that want the money, um, it will give them the most. Right? The great thing about 10% is that it's very easy to calculate. It would put a lot of accountants, uh, CPAs, uh, etc., out of business because it wouldn't be so complicated to do our taxes. And the other thing that's interesting about 10% is it happens to be what the Bible teaches as the tithe. <clears throat> so it's a good number. But the point here is that taxes are a major destroyer of wealth. Okay, so I'm talking about the three different ways that a person can view money. One is the spender, another is as the investor, but the third one is as a banker. Now I've been a spender as everyone has been and I've been an investor and I've suffered losses from taking on too much risk. But it took me a very very long time to start thinking as a banker. It's not natural, I would say, but it is logical. Let me show you why. The banker views money as a way to make money, right? Not as a way to trade their money for investments, but as an opportunity to make a gain by always keeping his or her money working. What do I mean by that? By keeping that money earning interest, compound interest, as a matter of fact. You know, compound interest is the interest earned on accumulated interest. And 
the story goes that once upon a time, Albert Einstein was asked, what's the most powerful force in the universe? Now, here's the guy that was the expert in the forces of gravity and expert in the forces, uh, strong nuclear forces of the atom. And so somebody was trying to say, you know, uh, ask him, well, which, is, which is stronger of all the forces? And he came back with, well, the strongest force in the universe is compound interest. <laughs> now, it's possible that story is not true, but it's a great story. Why would he answer compound interest? Well, when you take uh, the force of gravity, you know it gets weaker the further away you get from the mass of an object. You, when you take the strong nuclear forces, do you know they get weaker the further away you get from the center of the atom? But compound interest gets bigger the further away you get from its inception. And we call that the wealth curve. It's money working over time. Let me show you a little graphic here that I did for my daughter, Stephanie. When she graduated from college, um, I told her, look, you ought to put away $5,000 a year in savings. And if you grow that $5,000 a year just at 5%, look at where it will end up. By the time you're 80, and her grandmother was 80, uh, you would have $1.7 million accumulated. Well, boom, that sounded like a no-brainer, and she started doing it. But five years down the road, so she's now uh, 20, let's see, she was 22 when she graduated, 27 years old. She's still driving the same car that I helped her get when she went away to college. Okay, and it was a used car at that. So it, it's beat up. She's got a good job. She's got $25,000 saved. And guess what? The temptation was so great to go take that money and buy a new car. Well, once she did that, what did she feel like? Now she's got no money, right? She's got a new car, but she's got no money. And she says, I'm, you know what? I'm not doing that again. I, 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 I'm going to accumulate that money and keep it going. Well, she gets out here someday in the long distant future to 80 years old and she'll have $1.3 million and goes, wait a second, my dad said that I was going to have $1.7 million to live off of. That was wrong. No, it was correct. But what happened was she fell off the wealth curve when she spent that money. So is the solution to, oh, oh and by the way, it was only $25,000 here. It's $400,000 here. Yeah. And more realistically, when she's 65 and she retires and this nest egg was supposed to be, you know, up here at $800,000 or a million dollars at 70 years old and it's down here at, uh, you know, less than $800,000, <clears> you know, how could it be such a big spread? because of the way the wealth curve works, right? If you fall off the wealth curve, you still end, you don't end up at the same place. You still, in the future, are going to end up at the same age. You just end up with less money. Now, that's, that's the consequence of falling off the wealth curve one time in your whole life. What do most people do? Well, let's take this guy here. This is somebody who falls off the wealth curve at 27 when he buys a car, at 35, um, he puts a down payment on a house. At 41, uh, he buys a boat. <laughs> you know, at, at, at 50 or 48, he pays for um, college for one of his kids. At 55, he, he pays for a wedding. At 62, he takes everybody on a family vacation. He falls off the wealth curve one, two, three, four, five, six times only. And he realizes, oh my gosh, I was supposed to be have a, be a millionaire by now. I've got to stop spending money. And he works real hard to keep his savings. And he's got 300000 at the age of 80. That's only falling off the wealth curve six times. Folks, most people fall off the wealth curve six times every year in terms of their accumulated wealth. Is the key to stop spending money? That's not going to happen. 
was this guy wrong to buy a new car, uh, to put a down payment, you know, uh, buy a boat, that's his money, you know, pay for college, he's not going to not do that, or pay for a wedding, I guarantee you he's not going to get away with not doing that, okay? All of these things are going to happen in life. Does that mean it's impossible to stay off on the wealth curve? Not at all. Private family banking is the key to staying on the wealth curve for the rest of your life. What if you could use your money without giving up the interest that it would earn? You see, it was that compound interest that created the wealth curve. What if I could use the money and not lose the interest earned? How do I start a private family bank? Well, I create a pool of money and I put that money to work earning compound interest. Then I use the pool of money as collateral whenever I need cash. Okay, well, what if that money was earning 4% and to borrow or access it, you know, to use it as collateral, I had to pay 6%. Well, that would be stupid, right? That's what I would have said uh, because I'm going to spend a higher rate than I'm earning. And so I might as well drop off the wealth curve. Let's, let's look at this calculator, okay? And let's take my car example, a $30,000 car, right? And I'm going to pay for it over 60 months. <clears throat> and I'm going to pay 6% interest on that money that I borrowed. Now, I have that much money. I could just pay cash. So how does this compare? Well, that $30,000 borrowed at 6% is going to cost me $580 a month to repay. So after 60 months, I will have spent $34,799. Okay? So how much of that was interest? Easy math. $4,800. You know, call it that, right? So I could have saved $4,800 just by paying cash. Ah, but look at this. That $30,000 grew at just 4% over that same period of time. It turned into $36,630, which is more. How much I spent, $34,800, or how much I got, $36,630. Obviously, the 36630 is more. How could it be? Because I'm paying a higher interest rate than I'm earning. And I always stop and ask the people I'm sharing this with, that sharing this with how, how could that be? Well, the answer is this. When I pay interest, I pay it on a, uh, when I pay back a loan, I pay interest on a decreasing balance, right? Every month, I owe less because I made a payment. Okay, but when I earn interest, I'm earning it on an ever-increasing balance, and it ends up being greater. Now, what happens, you know, how does it look if my borrowing rate is really 5%? Well, I just paid less for it. What if my earning rate was more? If it was 5%, then I just earn more. And here's something crazy. If I was earning 5%, even if I had to borrow the money at 10%, which is very high these days. I would, my outlay for the car would be would be thirty eight thousand two hundred and forty five dollars, but my account balance would have grown to thirty eight thousand five hundred, still more, and that's twice. That's a interest rate twice as high as what I'm earning. That's the way compound interest works. So, where am I going to put my money then? If I'm going to accumulate a pool of money and put it to work, well, I could, I could accumulate it in the stock market, right? Now, I would say, if, you, if you'll let me, that let's do an analogy here to the three little pigs. Putting your money in the stock market is like putting your money in the house of straw, right? It, it's very frequent that the big bad wolf comes along and he huffs and puffs and blows your house down, okay? Look at Facebook as an example, down 70% just since the beginning of the year. Well, I could put my money in uh, real estate. 
Well, that's kind of like the House of Sticks in the Three Little Pigs story. Still, the big bad wolf can come along and huff and puff and blow your house down. All of us have heard of people whose houses have appreciated. But there have been many times when the housing market, real estate market, has gone down. And if you uh, are trying to sell a piece of property when the housing market is down, good luck. It's very, very difficult. Okay? Well, so what's safe? In the Three Little Pigs story, it was the house of bricks, right? You know, where that big bad wolf could huff and puff and couldn't blow it down. But these are financial instruments with guarantees, right? So it's not going to blow your house down and take the uh, accumulated interest along with it. Things like savings accounts and CDs and insurance contracts. Now, the difference between these are that CDs and savings accounts have been earning almost no interest. And that was intentional. They wanted people to not be savers. They wanted them to be spenders so that it kept the economy um, flourishing, okay, supposedly. But the fact of the matter is, is insurance contracts are different, and they have been earning higher interest rates. Well, let's look at the ideal objectives for your money. First of all, you know, mentally answer these questions. Would you like to have no risk involved with your money? Yes. How about, would you like to have guarantees? I think most people would say yes. Would you like to have no penalties associated with accessing your money? Yep. <laughs> Liquidity, use, and control of your money, the ability to get to it, unlike when you've got a piece of real estate and the market's down and you can't sell it. Protected, would you like your money to be protected from creditors? Fliverous lawsuits. Leverage, would you want to create the most amount of wealth using the least amount of money? Well, sure. How about tax deferred? Would you like the money to be growing tax deferred so you're not having that effect that I was showing previously where every dollar that you earned was being taxed and, and, and diminishing what you accumulated? Would you like to have tax free, uh, your money to be tax free, in fact, upon distribution? Your money to be available uh, as collateral for loans like I was showing you to accomplish this banking strategy. What about tax deductible payments? You know, when you put your money in, do you want the payment to be tax deductible? And I want to say this to all the agents listening. Hey, this is one thing to be aware of. Our contributions to a life insurance policy are not tax deductible. This is a little bit of a red herring here because many people are very motivated by that, but I want to show you what they give up just to get this one benefit, all right? So hang on to that. A disability benefit, it, where if you became disabled, someone else would make the contribution for you, <laughs> have wealth transfers so that this money could transfer to your heirs tax-free. Well, let's compare what you probably said yes to all those things, and let's compare that to what you might be doing right now. Uh, in your IRA 401k, well, is it protected? Yes. Is it tax deferred? Yes. Are you getting those tax deductible payments that you wanted? Yes. But look at everything else you're giving up. So this isn't really what you're seeking, even though you might be doing it right now. What about a brokerage account? Okay, well, do you have liquidity, use, and control? Sure. Yeah, you can sell your stuff whenever you want to. doesn't mean you'll get all your money back, but that's that. Um, so, but most of that is no. What about your home? You can borrow from it uh, penalty free. Is it protected? Yeah, your homestead's protected. But otherwise, there's not very many advantages to keeping your money, uh, your wealth stored there. CDs and savings. Yeah, you get guarantees uh, and it's risk free. Um, you have liquidity, use, and control, but you have none of these other benefits. Annuities, real estate. So is there something that gives you all of these with the exception of, of the tax deductible payments? Yes. Private family banking, we use the same financial instrument that banks use to park their money in a place that's safe and gets guaranteed growth. Banks call it bank-owned life insurance. It's owned by most banks. It's recommended by the FDIC. Because banks know that permanent life insurance is a safe and liquid way to hold and use capital. So 
we can build for our clients a custom life insurance policy that gives you liquidity, safety, guaranteed growth, protection from taxes, and protection from judgments or lawsuits in most states. It's not the typical life insurance contract. You know, there's I'm I'm graphing three different kinds of life insurance here. Two that everybody's heard of before, term life insurance and a typical whole life policy. Uh, but what I'm graphing is the cash accumulation in these policies. A term life insurance policy has no cash accumulation. You can't use it for this concept of accumulating a pool of money because it does not. A whole life insurance policy will eventually accumulate money, but it does it slowly. It gets a lot of criticism for that slow ramp up time. So what we build is an, a policy that's optimized for cash accumulation. So private family banking, if you could control your own banking system, you could capture the interest that you've been spending or giving up to someone else, never to see again. If we look at the spending percentages of the typical American family, about 20% of their uh, after-tax income goes to automobiles, 30% to housing, 40% to their living expenses, and if they're doing well, about 10% of their after-tax dollars goes into savings. But let's look more carefully, carefully at this. How much of what the typical American is spending on autos is going to interest? That's my col portion of the column here that's in yellow. How much of what they're spending on housing is going to interest? And just general uh, living expenses going to interest. You know, if you add it all up, what they've been paying, the typical American is paying to banking institutions, dwarfs what they're paying, uh, saving for themselves every paycheck. Well, what if you could create a pool of money by making premium payments into this pool of money and then using that pool of money as collateral for your car purchases for the things that you otherwise would put on a credit card and pay off over time and eventually accumulate a pool of money big enough to take over your mortgage well then you could recapture the money you've been throwing away in interest and I what I did here was I just stacked up those percentages that was going to someone else, some other financial institution, and said, if you were playing the role of your own banker, you would be accumulating all that money rather than it going away. It would be like boosting your savings by almost 35%. So this is what it looks like in a graph over time. Above this zero line in green is what the typical American is saving. And below the line is what the typical American is spending on interest. By becoming your own bank and establishing a private family banking system, you can push all of that interest above the line and begin to accumulate that. Again, without working any harder, without taking on any risks, and without spending less money. Just being your own banker. The begin benefits of private family banking, well, you also get a death benefit because we use a life insurance, an optimized life insurance contract to accomplish this. You, you have a savings account compared to a, a health savings account, the money you, know, you could use to um, cover expenses for medical expenses, disability protection if you put a rider on the policy, guaranteed access, it's your, it could be your uh, emergency, it is your emergency fund, it could be like a college savings fund, a retirement fund, uh, you have asset, pr asset protection in case of a lawsuit, you have tax protected growth like a Roth, you pay taxes on the money going in, but you can have tax free access on the money when you access it. It's an estate planning tool like a trust. All of those benefits. And as the man I first learned this idea from by reading his book, Nelson Nash said, everyone should be in two businesses. What they do for a living and the banking business. So if that makes sense to you or you'd like to find out how that would work specifically for you and your family, please give us a call and let us meet for an hour
to build a customized plan that would work for you.